we begin with the first question what is purushartha the object of desire of all purusha is called purushartha the word is purusha purusha word should be understood in sanskrit or hindi it means man so many many might think oh it's only for men not for women but see a woman is speaking so definitely and lot of women are present at the moment as audience so it is nothing to do with the gender or the biology when we say purusha then the purusha means uh, it is like two words so in sanskrit there are two words one is pura and then the other is ashraya pura means town and ashraya means the one who resides in it so if this body is considered to be as a town then who resides in this is a nothing to do with the genitals but it has everything to do with who resides inside this body that is called purusha right so purusha means the one who resides in the body and lest you forget the mind we are also talking about the one who resides in the mind so the complete meaning would be the one who resides in body and mind is called purusha and the question is what is purushartha purush means as i've already explained and the artha means what's the objective now what's the objective of the purusha now when we say purusha then um, if if say you ask this question to any roadside man or woman what is the objective of the, your life most of them will talk about money another section will talk about marriage and children and another might talk about politics and power and maybe who is very sorrowful and miserable might say oh i wish to get liberation it's you know like finding a needle in a stack of hay you won't find a person who would actually say that even when somebody says that i want to i want liberation or moksha or salvation you know all these uh, synonyms of uh, word they are usually very uh, in great pain or misery unhappy failed people they had failed marriage they couldn't get you know money they couldn't get any position they were ridiculed abused they were uh, battered so badly in this oh this world is not a place to live in so i don't want to live so god give me liberation although that is not what the real meaning of liberation is but in general sense it is and that's why sometimes people even commit suicide why are you doing they write the footnote they write the, the suicide letter because i am so unhappy and there is no hope for me left and it's all dark hence i end my life and i don't want to live might accuse somebody for his or her death might not do that but all the suicide letters are coming with the great agony and pain and misery and somehow with some great stupidity they think it is what liberation is this is what they think which is so wrong now what do our sages talk about what should be the objective of life although you know even in, in your schools you must have written what do you want to be when you grow up oh, i want to be pilot and engineer i want to be a actor i want to be a police officer or a navy officer or a air hostess or 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 prime minister of the country or a president children have their own ideas so just to make them write and give them the skill to write so the teachers in every school world over are making the children give this dream you know you chalk out what you want to be when you grow up but when we say objective of life then we have to understand from the point of view of our great masters of what veda says veda is i would say mother of all higher wisdom 
The word Veda comes from the root word called Vid, V-I-D, and Vid means knowledge. So Veda means that which is talking about just knowledge. And this knowledge, uh, we also say, is not coming from uh, any human mind, but it is coming from that divinity. Hence we call knowledge as divine. We don't call it that Vedas are created by a human being. Vedas are called a Purusheya, which means not created by a Purusha, meaning man. Man, it's not created by a man, it's created by God. And our holy scriptures, sacred scriptures say that even when the world dies, for example, so I would say nuclear bomb explodes and everybody dies, now all the minds have died and the bodies have died. Now has the knowledge died? No, not at all. Because this knowledge is coming from the source of the divinity. Hence, even if every human being dies, and in time, in time, when the evolution again begins to happen, and then again the human beings are, you know, born, and and then they begin to again, you know, those baby steps towards getting civilized and then again you know seeking and then again looking for answers oh how come sun is there and how come lightning is happening and getting scared of every you know fury of nature and doesn't know how to even walk or and then the language develops you know I'm going back into that ancient primitive you know the evolution of the, of the human being how long will it take for this new crop to reach to that point where they begin to decode this divine knowledge. Oh my God. Not the God God, but still oh my God. <laughs> but it is said, the Puranas are talking about, uh, we have a word called Kalpa. Chatur Yuga means the four Yugas. When we say four yugas, then, then the, like for example, this Kali Yuga, double of that, then the Dwapar, then triple of that is Treta, and four of that is Satya Yuga. So it turns out to be a very large number, and that is called one Chatur Yugi. So how many Kalpas? Uh, will be allowing this human race to function. But in between, when a one yuga changes to another, there is a great destruction which happens. It happened after Sajjug, it happened after Dwapar, it happened after Treta. And, and in this particular Chatur Yugi, what happened is that the yuga's uh, linear sequence got changed. So usually it is Sajjuk, Dwapar, Treta, but this time it was Sajjuk, Treta and Dwapar. And there is a whole story behind it, I don't wish to go into that. So, in every Kalpa and in every Yuga, it is said that who is born first? And our Vedas give us a beautiful answer. They say the sages are born first. So the seven sages, the Saptarishi, where you are sitting at the moment, is called the Saptarishi Hall. So the Saptarishis are the ones, the seven sages are the ones who will be always born first. And they are the ones who will come with all the knowledge. And then they will be the one who will be the primary teachers or the Acharya in Sanskrit we say, would be the Acharyas to those who wish to learn. So, our Acharyas say, when I say Acharya, I am going all the way to Saptarishi. And when I say Saptarishi, I am going all the way to Brahma. Are you getting? So, Dharma is not an invention of any crazy human being. It's a principle. It's a principle, it's a divine principle. So the Dharma, uh, meaning the, the very loose meaning is righteousness. 
Dharma, many people think it's a religion, uh, but it is not religion. When we say Dharma, then the Dharma means the natural aptitude and the reality of your true self. I'm saying true self, not the false self. True self, in core, what's true, is true. And knowing that is Dharma. So going to church or a Gurudwara or a temple is not becoming a Dharmic person. You become a, a religious person. Now I am redefining the word religion. You are a religious person only then when you begin to understand the universal principle of truth. And if you don't know what is that, then you are not a religious person. And, and all these so-called religious people are actually making a mockery of the whole thing. Somebody goes just Sunday, somebody goes Friday, somebody goes Tuesday, somebody goes every day. And they have a set of rituals which they do, they have a set of verses which they read, they have a set of music which they will sing. But they have nothing to do about what the ultimate universal principle of divinity is. So, what is the objective of human life? The answer is, there are four objectives of human life. Now, this might give answer to so many minds who are always asking, why are we born? And here comes the answer. The first is Dharma, to know the Dharma. Now, it, it, it's not talking about Hindu, Christian, uh, Buddhist or Jaina Dharma. When we are saying Dharma, then it is meaning is the absolute universal principle of divinity. We are not talking about the religious symbols and the structures and the holy books and what not. We are talking about that principle on based of which Everything has been come into existence. So what is the Dharma? Is there a Dharma of me as an individual? Is there a Dharma which is there in contact with other person? Is there a Dharma which is just um, totally uh, connected to the Parabrahm? So Dharma. The second is called the Artha. Artha word means meaning. Artha doesn't mean just the optimal pursuits of livelihood. Artha means meaning. What gives meaning to my life? And Artha also means money, sure. In Sanskrit, Artha also means money. But in reality, the word artha means that which gives meaning to my life. Like say, for a painter, painting is what gives meaning to his life. For a sculptor, it's the art. For an engineer, it might be his work. For a mother, it might be just bringing up her children. Just giving them the meaning. But the question is, is it the true meaning? What's the real meaning? of you and what's the real meaning of this universe and also artha is because also related to wealth hence the humans should have the ability to to create wealth now when i say wealth it's not just the currency and the money and the gold diamond silver only it is also wealth of knowledge it is also wealth of experiences. It's also a wealth of poetry. It's also wealth of all the creative arts and the faculties related to that. So when we say wealth, usually the first thing which, you know, it's a bummer, but that's what people do. Oh, it's all about money. But it's not. Money is just a one small tool to give you ability to create some comfort around you. Buy food grains, 
buy the stuff to sustain the life in the family. Right? But they say, is your livelihood pertaining to the rules of Dharma or not? Now, how many people think on that? Like in uh, Buddhism, Buddha gave a rule that my monks, when they'll go out to beg once a day, they will not accept alms from a prostitute's house, gambler's house, slave trader's house, those who run a tavern, those who deal in alcohol, those who are burglars, robbers. Can you imagine 2500 years ago, if we say, in the Buddha's time, what would be the population of a village? Very small. And out of that, he had this long list of where the monk will not go to beg. So how many houses must have been left from where he or she can go to beg? Nobody thinks on these lines. But Artha is related to Dharma. So if you are a Dharmic person, then the chances are that your ability to earn money, your livelihood too will be based on the Dharma and not based on the Adharma. And we have hundreds of stories like Sri Krishna um, rejected invitation of Duryodhana to eat his food, saying, not saying directly on his face, but he said, no, I choose Bidar. And at that time, Bidar had already resigned as the chief advisor to the king, a king, Dhritarashtra, who was a very evil-minded person. And Duryodhana is son of this king. And Krishna said, no, I go and eat at Bidar's home, not your home. I'll be guest of this noble person and not yours. Why? Because Bidar is living on the lines of the Dharma and the Kuru king, the Trastra, and his hundred sons were not living as per the Dharma. So he says, I'll not eat food. Same goes for Guru Nanak's life. Guru Nanak rejects the invitation of Malik Bhagu. Um, he was like a wazir, he's called a wazir, meaning a chieftain of the area. And um, but Guru Nanak accepts a food invitation of a person who was a carpenter. He says, I'll eat your food. It might be very simpler, staple, Spartan, but it's the livelihood of this person is great. Why? Because this person is living by Dharma. Now, how many Sikhs and how many Hindus today are following this diktat of their Sri Krishna and Guru Nanak Dev? That's something which everybody should think about. If you are making money by evil ways, uh, you are not a dharmic person. So the, what are the principles? If are understood, then it will definitely uh, represent and reflect in your ways of your livelihood. And even in the livelihood, there are rules given, in, uh, for example, in Yajur Veda, that whatever you earn by right means, 10% of that should be given away in the charity. Now, in those years, there were no beggars. So what does charity mean? That it, then it used to mean that you serve the seers, the sages, the mahatmas. Those were the times, if you, if you see those, uh, say, 2,000-year-old temples are there in India. There, there you have these carvings on the walls and the stones. Even a so-called poor is wearing hundreds of ornaments. More so their buffaloes and their donkeys and their, their horses are having those ornaments. Nobody was poor in this country. There was no beggar. In our Bharat, we have a word called Danam. Danam means that this is the share, the 10% is the share of all those who are teachers, acharyas, all those who are practicing, all those who are renunciates, all those uh, young ones who are a student 
and learning the path of knowledge. So your 10% should be given to them. It could be a single person, a scholar or a great Brahmin or a great sage who is just uh, doing the meditations and not teaching also. You say it's better to serve this person. Why? Because the austerities done by this renunciate, the punya, the virtues of this person's austerity, tapasya, is going to benefit the whole population. So it's not about feeding a hungry person and then that person after having his belly filled goes out and kills somebody and do some theft and do some evil things or, uh, or goes out to rape a woman or kill a man or abduct a child and, and do some very evil things. So in our country when we would say do dhanam, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not omitting the word charity, mind you. I'm saying dhanam, then it meant serving the knowledgeable people because we have always worshipped what? Knowledge. And in this country, nobody was poor. Nobody was poor. And it is, I believe, just a matter of that, that certain people who came in this country used their power and might to loot this country so it's the money which was looted from this country, which went all the way even to uh, Rome, to Alexandria, to Portuguese, to France, name it, to Afghanistan, to Mughals. So this country had been plundered by all those people who were, I would say, just looters, who came here just to loot this country. And they were the ones like the Alauddin Khilji, such a tyrant, who just burnt the, the library, which was the world's largest library, and he just burnt it. I don't know why, what was the allergy to the education. He burnt the biggest library of this world, and it is said that the fires kept on raging for three months. Can you believe how many books were there? How many books were there? So this country never had this poverty. And we don't have this idea of doing charity, but we definitely have an idea of dhanam. And we have idea of dakshina. Dakshina is, you know, dhanam is when you offer, say, food. And the person, and the dakshina is, again, given. Why? It's like, thank you that you have accepted my dhanam. Can you believe? You see, it's like, thank you for accepting my dhanam because you have all the means and right to say, no, I won't take it. I won't accept it. You know, I, I myself have been rejected like this one time to a great yogi who lived for 153 years old. I went to see him and, and I would receive so much of his love and blessings. And one time I... I received a beautiful silver, well, very well carved uh, picture with a small glass on the top which is also like uh, um, to cover it like a lid. Very beautiful piece of... So the moment I received it, I said, no, it has to go to Swamiji. Because one time I saw there's a silver glass in which he was drinking water because our country, the kings would drink in the gold utensils. And all the Vaishyas would drink in silver. And silver or copper or gold, these metals were used in daily uh, needs. And today, everybody, those who are working in the science and the toxicology are saying that if you, if you use a silver glass, the silver has a natural capacity to ionize the water and it purifies, so does copper, so does gold. So I had seen that silver glass, so I felt that why not I take this. So I, I take it and I had some fruits and I had some other stuff, so I just laid everything and, 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 and he looks at fruit and he said, that's okay. And he looks at that silver carved picture, he said, mm. I felt so bad. But, but I cannot, you know, 
out of great respect and love for him, I cannot fight with him or say, why not? Or plead again, no, you have to. Because whatever he is saying is coming from a great intelligence. So anyhow, I am I'm using that picture now. <laughs> I am using that picture now. So, Artha and then Kama. Kama is the third objective and the Kama means the fulfillment of desires. Kama also means the sexual satisfaction. Harish has never said that you have to remain a celibate. Celibacy was advised uh, for students, for a brahmachari, so that they do not lose their seminal energies. And Ayurveda gives us the process that it takes almost three months for the semen to be created, to be, produ to be produced in a human body. S same goes for the women and the men. It takes three months. Whatever you eat, after that whole complicated process, in 15 days the blood is formed, then rasa, rakta, mamsa, me, asti, meda, majja, you know. And the last is the shukra. So conserving your seminal fluids is very, very advisable because this is like a portion essence which is going to run your systems properly. And the very sattvic part of the food which you eat is going to create your mind. So this means after the shukra we have the earth dhatu and that dhatu is called the urja. There's a shukra and after shukra they say there's the urja. So if you keep on losing your, you know, it's just a pleasure of say 10 minutes or maybe 5 minutes and then, then what? Then nothing, then you are back to being that same dumbo what you were initially. But it's, it is the carnal pleasure is something which is intrinsically in a human mind and in a human body. We know the science of hormones. Our rishis were very, very aware and very, very intelligent. Hence, they gave a system. They said that as long as you are in your study period, the brahmacharya period, Doing that in your Gurukula, in presence of the Master, just imagine living your first 25 years in the shadow of the Master. And mastering your body, mind and senses. And learning all about Upanishads and everything. Where is the time to, you know, have that self-satisfaction modules or having a, a heterosexual uh, uh, affairs or something, there is no time for that nonsense. He said, don't, don't allow your mind to go into there. Don't allow your body to go into there. Conserve your energies. Conserve your energies. And once you are done with the study, that would be by 25, then they would say, okay, now, now go to the marriage. And now we give you the license to have your carnal pleasures, but then the, the education is there. And education said, don't have sex on Purnima, don't have it on Ekadashi, don't have it on Amavasya, don't have it on Ramnomi, Janamashtri, all the days when these great avatars happened, don't have it on a day when any lunar or solar eclipse happens, because there are now hundreds of researches that all those children who are conceived in these eclipse days will be born handicapped. They will be. Uh, not having all the systems working properly. And in astrology, we have the Vedic astrology, we have a system to calculate that if, say, somebody is blind or deaf or dumb or, or crippled or mentally uh, underdeveloped, then the calculations are there, then it takes, you know, right to that point when this child was conceived and that turned out to be a lunar eclipse day. Such a wrong day to do that. Now, unfortunately, how many, how many people know this? And this is what I would say the biggest plundering of this, this country is that now people have lost this information which used to be on the fingertips of everybody. Because in the Gurukulas, you would study the Vedanga and astrology is one of that. So when you know Vedanga, you know about Tithi, you know about Rikta Tithi, you know about the calculations, you know about the 
Krishna Paksha and the Shukla Paksha, uh, the bright days and the dark days, and you know about the Sandhi Kalas, and you know about all these mathematical, astronomical calculations, you can't go wrong. No wonder that Rishi Parashar gives birth to somebody like Veda Vyasa. No wonder. Because it's not that, oh, they were in a heat and they had sex and the child got conceived and the Dumbo came out after nine months. No, 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 no. no. They had a very classy, uh, patient, very patient way of seeing what's the right time, what's the right dasha. You know, all astrology is working in the foreground. And with that knowledge, the couple would choose the time, the mahurata. And then they would pray to God, Lord, Almighty, whatever, that we may be blessed with some holy soul, that we don't give birth to a devil. When I say devil, the, it's like a person who has evil drives in the mind. Filled with anger, filled with greed, filled with ego filled with that unresolved and very agitated energies who loves to kill and enjoys that killing. So, karma, the desires, and karma also means the, the very physical, uh, the intimacy or the carnal pleasures, and, but definitely it means your old desires. Now, let's go back. If you know the principle of dharma, and your livelihood is also coming out of that, isn't it that so would happen to your desires also? You won't have a non-dharmic desires in your mind. That's why the sequence you see is telling the whole story. First comes the dharma, then comes the artha, then comes the kama. So if you take away the dharma, then the livelihood, the artha will be wrong. There is no meaning in life. And so would happen to your karma. You will be having those desires which you should not. So the dharma would give you the clarity and the, the clairvoyance to have right kind of desires in the mind. And as I have earlier said that the desires are like those seeds which you sow in the subconscious. And in time they will all sprout and become a tree. And then you have to eat the fruits of that seed. So whatever you desire. Today you became little intelligent. Oh, now I don't want it. Well, sorry, the seed has been sown. And you don't even know which part of the subconscious that seed was sown. So there is no way to, to uproot that sprout which might be growing inside. You know, take the analogy of the seed sprout, plant and tree. Seed is just this small and like a banyan tree, huge. So when that desire seed was sown, it was very tiny, tiny. But when it will grow, it will become such huge. I am recalling the banyan tree, which is, I would say, world's biggest banyan tree in close to Calcutta. And it is spread in area of, I think so, almost eight, eight acres. So thousands of banyan trees that the branches have gone down into the earth and they have come up as a new tree and then the branches have gone and spread and so. And the original one, the original tree, they say actually at, in, there was a huge floods which happened and it got uprooted. But then again it grew itself and now this particular section is also almost 800 years old. 800 years old and the initial one was much bigger than this. Now bring the desire seed and then see how big it can go. Right? So based on dharma, your artha should be and your karma and then comes the moksha. So these four collectively are called the purushartha and that's what the objective of human life is. You see, they never said to seek God. They have never said to know what heaven is. They never said to know about um, meeting God. 
they are hitting into the very uh, scientifically, and he's talking about dharma, artha, kama, and moksha. Now, one would wonder that uh, if you are are having dharma and artha and kama, why would you, you know, why would anybody's mind move towards the the moksha? Moksha is breaking the bondage. Why would anybody want that? See, when when you in the Indian Hindu marriage, they give the hand the hand of bride to the hand of uh, groom and then they tie a piece of cloth and they say now we bind you to one another and people are enjoying that bondage they get their photos clicked when that bondage is done and somehow we have Raksha Bandhan where the sisters are tying this thread onto the wrist of brother and we have many, many, you know, these small festivals where the mothers tie this thread onto her children. And there's another name to it, where the mother uh, observe fast for her children and then she ties that, that thread, the sacred thread, onto the wrist of her three, four or two or one children. And she prays for them. The people enjoy that. The child enjoys this bondage given by mother. The mother enjoys the bondage, the sister, brother the husband, wife, they are all enjoying this bondage. Why would anybody want to break animal? I mean, human beings are social animals. Why would anybody want to break this bondage? Now here comes again, go back to Dharma. Dharma is, it will teaches you about what is the Dharma of a human body. Born will die. So today you tie that thread and you might in a filmy way say, oh, we'll be husband, wife for next seven births. I don't know why seven, not eight, not nine, not six, why seven? And we'll be bound to one another. Oh God, every year, every you know, life I need you as a, my wife and you know, my, my husband. And that is just the crappiest thing to say coming out of a crazy mind. Because if I could make you see your own past life, this particular person for whom you want to die for, was not even in this scenario. And today you are saying, oh, next seven birth we, sh we, might, we should always, you know, God bless us, we should be together. It's just a fantasy. Just a fantasy. Once the body dies, the relations dies too. And in astrology, very interesting part. The first house is house of the native. The seventh house, which is Dire opposite to the first in the chart which we draw is the house of the spouse. And this is also house of enemy. <laughs> so your enemy is your spouse. Very, very dangerous statement. The first house is opposite the seventh house and first is native and the, the seventh house is house of enemy. But it's also house of husband and wife and your spouse also is of the business partner. Yes, there are many meanings to that. But there is some, some account to be adjusted. Some depths are to be cleared. That's why you get tied with that person. Now, mutually, you will be, you know, tit for tat. So giving misery and happiness to one another and settling some old account. That's called marriage. Why would anybody want to break that? Now, if you go into the dharma, and if you go into the depth of what the, the, the dharma of a body is, this body is neither wife nor daughter of anybody. Does this hand know that this hand belongs to somebody who is called Ananda Murti? Doesn't know. If a hair falls out, will this hair cry, Oh my God, I have been separated from this divine head? <laughs> no. Right? So this body is like a, a discarded piece or a fallen strand of hair. What's the value to this? So when this body doesn't hold any value, then what does value to all your relationships mean? It's just that mind doesn't want to live alone. Why? Because it doesn't know the truth. So he's looking for some anchors. Okay, you be my anchor, you be my anchor. And that's why all the love birds will say to one another, never leave me. <laughs> You'll be always mine. You will never commit any adultery. Can you promise me that? 
and even if they say yes, but your mere asking is a proof that you doubt. You know it in your heart. The man's mind is very polygamous. And maybe so might be of the woman also. I, I won't say that woman's mind is monogamous. So everybody, because they're basically they're still animals. If you're not a realized person, you're just an animal. And in dogs and donkeys and horses, they don't have this monogamy thing. It's just when they are in the heat, they are just looking for who is available. So whosoever is available, it might be their own mother. You know, it's a human definition of mother. But this, this dog doesn't know this is my mother and I cannot have sex. I have, I, we had a bitch at home. She gave birth to those pups. Then those pups grew. Then that, that pup in the second year was jumping on his own mother. And now we, the children, were pulling <laughs> the dog away. She's your mother. You cannot do this. But does the dog know? So body has uh, no temperamental or emotional system to see that this is right or wrong. It's just a dead piece of bone, skin, flesh, blood, urine, phlegm, wind. It's just pack of that. Flesh, bones and phlegm. That's what the body is. So once you know the dharma, same goes. Then you understand what's the dharma of the mind. Then you understand what's the dharma of your five senses. So once you have known all this, you definitely will crave for liberation and moksha. But the more intelligence you will get, the more your mind will look for truth, eternity. I'm not saying that the person will just rush off to some stony cave and close himself or herself and away from everybody, but it's like realization of what the fact is. So dharma, artha, kama and moksha, that is the prime objective of any human life. See, so important information. And nobody is being taught. And this is what our Gurukula used to teach to a five, uh, eight year old kid. Up till eight, the mother and father would teach the child at home. And by eight, when this uh, child would be uh, enrolled into a Gurukula, this is what the Rishis, the teachers, the Acharyas would teach Dharma, Artha, Kama, Moksha. And the child is getting to learn about how the life should go about.